Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Um, as a member of the coordinating committee uh, of the Witnessing Genocide Conference, a small member, by the way, I should say, uh, the heavy lifting was all done by uh, Judith and Steve and the others on the committee. Um, still, it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce today's distinguished keynote speaker, James E. Young. There are a few scholars, I think, whose teaching, writing, and work in the public sphere have influenced so profoundly how we think and talk about the problems to which this conference uh, is devoted than Professor Young. His list of accomplishments as a teacher is very long indeed. Um, too long, of course, to enumerate in all details, so I'll just touch on the highlights. After receiving his PhD from the University of California in 1983, Young taught for several years at NYU, New York University, where he held the Dorot Chair uh, in English, his Hebrew, and Judaic Studies. Since 1988, uh, he took, uh, res in 1988, he took up residence at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, where he's been uh, ever since, and now serves as the uh, chair of the Department of Judaic and Near Eastern Studies. Um, this is by no means an exhaustive list. Uh, his other teaching accomplishments include Bryn Mawr, Washington University, Harvard, Princeton, the list goes on and on. Uh, Professor Young's scholarly achievements are no less impressive. Um, he's author of, author of three major studies, Writing and Rewriting the Holocaust, published in 1988, The Texture of Memory, published by Yale University Press in 1993, which also won the National Jewish Book Award, and most recently at Memory's Edge, After Images of the Holocaust in Contemporary Art and Architecture, published in 2000, also by Yale University Press. In addition to this, uh, his articles and reviews have appeared in a long and distinguished list of critical uh, journals, historical journals as well, including Critical Inquiry, Representations, um, Holocaust and Genocide Studies, uh, just to name a few. Last but certainly not least, uh, Professor Young's articles have appeared in a host of publications that speak to a broader audience, both in the U.S. and abroad, such as The Forward, Tikkun, New York Times Magazine, the Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung, um, and the online magazine Slate. Um, in recognition of these many accomplishments, Professor Young has also been the recipient of grants, awards, fellowships, again, too many to enumerate, including a Guggenheim, an American Council of Learned Societies fellowship, and so forth. Um, it's this engagement in the public sphere that gets at what I consider to be Professor Young's most noteworthy achievement among the many. Um, he is a specimen of that rare breed of scholar whose work unites criticism and action in the public sphere. Not only does Professor Young, did Professor Young open up a field of scholarly inquiry into the nature of Holocaust memorialization? He also made active contributions to the evolving texture of memory. His 1993 book, bearing that title, reminded us that Holocaust monuments, like monuments everywhere, uh, were shaped by the story, the histories, the politics, the aesthetics, and the organizing myths of the societies that shaped them whether they were erected in Poland, Germany, or the United States. The motives of memory, he argues, are never pure. Thus, Holocaust memorials in the United States are also shaped by a national need to, quote, reinforce America's self-idealization as a haven for the world's oppressed. Young also argued, very much against the grain uh, of scholarship on Holocaust memory at the time, uh, that every monument contains within it a tension between its own concrete fixity in time and space and the reality that uh, memory is constantly changing shape, constantly and continually being formulated and reformulated as times and circumstances change. He showed that the traumatic nature of Holocaust memory only compounded these uh, ethical and, and aesthetic difficulties. How could one, for example, memorialize the victims of Nazi genocide without reproducing the dehumanizing effects of monumental figuration, which after all had been so central to Nazi aesthetics? On the other hand, how could one make monuments that avoided these pitfalls without sliding into self-referentiality? In answering these questions, Young devotes particularly close attention to anti-monuments, as he calls them, monuments that are crafted to undermine or in a few cases quite literally demolish their own monumentality as well as memorials that seek scrupulously to avoid or abolish the sovereign perspective of big monuments in central places. Young takes up and expands on all of these themes in his third major work at Memory's Edge, 2000, in which he describes an anti-redemptory aesthetic whose practitioners, quote, refuse to assign singular overarching meaning to either the events of the Holocaust or our memory of them, 
analyzing them in light of what's been called post-memory, the ethical and aesthetic problems that attend commemoration in an era when living memory of the Holocaust is slipping into the past. That said, um, James Young is not uh, only one of the most acute uh, students of Holocaust memory and commemoration, uh, he's also made crucial uh, contributions to the texture of memory. Um, already in 1994, he served as a guest curator uh, for an exhi exhibition at the Jewish Museum in New York City entitled The Art of Memory, Holocaust Memorials in History. And then in 1997, Young was appointed by the Senate of the City of Berlin to serve on a five-member jury for German Germany's national uh, memorial to Europe's uh, murdered Jews, which selected eventually Peter Eisenman's design, finished and dedicated in May 2005. And most recently, uh, Professor Young was uh, appointed by the Lower Manhattan Development Corporation uh, to the jury for the World Trade Center site memorial competition won by Michael Arad and Peter Walker, and now under construction. He's currently completing an insider's story of the World Trade Memorial site entitled Memory at Ground Zero, a juror's report on the World Trade Center site memorial. Uh, needless to say, we have a lot to learn from Professor Young today, uh, and he is going to speak to us about the stages of memory and the monument from Berlin to New York. So please welcome me, join me in welcoming uh, Professor Young. Well, thank you, David. Thank you, Judith, for pulling us together, Stephen, uh, and to uh, everybody for coming out. After Samantha's talk last night, um, I actually have to admit to being uh, a little worried about how to follow up and, and where to begin. Um, I just love the way she uh, handled herself on, on her feet and brought really, really difficult and complex issues into such clear relief you know, by her examples and by her working through. And um, I'd like to try uh, to do the same thing with uh, issues that might not be quite as complex, but they're just uh, another kind of, uh, another kind of uh, issue altogether, combining aesthetics, politics, um, uh, yes, representation, uh, commemoration, and, uh, and our relationship uh, to, to past events. Um, I thought I would begin um, not by arbitrarily yoking together uh, Berlin and New York. Uh, these are very, very different sets of events and processes. Um, the Berlin process uh, resulting in its, uh, the Denkmal for Europe's murdered Jews uh, now uh, installed in Berlin, dedicated in May 2005, um, is a commemoration of a genocide. <clears throat> and uh, it, it means to be just that. Uh, clearly, the 9-11 memorial downtown or the memorials uh, commemorating the attacks on September 11th, 2001, and also uh, February 26th, uh, 1993, are not memorials commemorating genocides, and so we're not going to talk about them in that way. But one of the first questions I was asked on, uh, just after announcing the Michael Arad Peter Walker winning design in January 2004, um, I got a, a call from a reporter uh, from the forward, I think it was Nathaniel Popper, um, who'd done his research, and I think he had written about the Berlin Memorial uh, and, uh, and, and that process. Of course, that memorial wasn't quite dedicated yet, but he knew all about it, and he'd read the book uh, at Memory's Edge uh, with my description of the Berlin process, <clears throat> and he'd followed very closely the process downtown, as everybody did, and it's pretty difficult to follow, for those of you who tried. Um, I do have to say that usually when I read the, uh, the New York Times, yeah, I, I say that I believe uh, everything I read in the Times except that about which I know, when they're <laughs> exactly wrong. But I believe everything else. <laughs> and in this case, um, I have to say the Times did get mostly right the discussion of the memorial process. Um, Ed Wyatt in particular and David Dunlap in particular did uh, great jobs summarizing what went on. But they only caught it in snatches so that only about every three or four weeks would there be an article. Uh, so I was kind of trying to understand this process you know, in, uh, according to flashes of lightning in a way. And, but um, Popper asked, so there you were uh, in Berlin and um, you end up with Peter Eisenman's design, uh, which uh, you chaired the jury that uh, chose this design and you wrote his rationale. 
And uh, this is, uh, comes on top of Liebeskind's Jewish Museum in Berlin, based on all these voids. <clears throat> and um, now you've been chosen to uh, be part of this memorial jury downtown to choose the World Trade Center site design. Did that have anything to do you know, with the Berlin process? And I said, yeah, I'm, I'm sure it did. You know, they did their research, too. And um, Anita Contini called me about three days after she was appointed. Um, uh, as the vice president uh, uh, of kind of the memorial design process for the LMDC. <clears throat> and she said, look, I've been doing my reading, and um, clearly you've got some experience working through very fraught processes. If you got through Berlin and survived it to tell the story, I wonder if you can help us, because I have a feeling we're going to be embarking on just this kind of a road. And I said, I'd you know, be happy to talk. And, um, and that's on the heels of being asked by the mayor and governor probably within uh, weeks, two weeks of the attacks in order to, uh, to come down and talk to them about the process as well, uh, what, what might be done downtown. But Nathaniel Popper then had a question that caught me a little bit off guard. He said, um, so in the end, in fact, uh, downtown now you've chosen two gigantic voids, reflecting absence, designed by Michael Arad and Peter Walker. Uh, in fact, isn't this just another big Holocaust memorial? I said, no. He goes, but it, it is, isn't it? Two big voids, a rod, you know, I've interviewed him now. He claims to have read all your books, and he's been following Holocaust memorials. He's an, an Israeli architect living in, in America, but trained in America. And um, isn't that what, you know, what it's all come down to? <clears throat> you know, kind of this uh, minimalist aesthetic. And um, so I began to think about it, and of course I, I resisted this notion, and I still resist it. It's not all Holocaust memorials. But it did become clear to me as I began trying to formulate an answer to him that um, even if every memorial designed after the Holocaust is not a Holocaust memorial, that architecture and art have in fact been inflected by knowledge and memory of the Holocaust. That in fact, after the war, there has been a preoccupation uh, with absence, with the voids, with loss, um, with kind of irredeemable, unconsolable, inconsolable loss. Um, we heard um, of in the discussions around Ceylon's poetry, and of course what comes to mind is Don Pagisa's you know, great, great poem, you know, lines written in pencil on a railway car, um, in which basically the poem ends in silence. It ends in loss. It's surrounded by a big empty page. Um, Eve's last sentence, you know, um, tell him that I, and then she just drops off the ledge at the very end of that poem. And um, uh, composers as well, not just relating to the Holocaust or attempting to respond to the Holocaust, um, also found that they had to respond to a kind of a more general breach in their trust of civilization and reassuring forms, re the redeeming forms of art and literature, um, even the possibility of making kind of a, a writing a certain history. So we have historians like Saul Friedlander um, questioning whether or not um, everything after Benjamin, that all kinds of histo historiography, especially Holocaust historiography, automatically mends and finds kind of redemptory closure somehow. And he would like to resist it, even though as a very great um, positivist historian, uh, he finds it's very difficult to write those interruptions into the kind of uh, historiography of the Holocaust that um, he, he wants to give us or leave us with. But so this preoccupation is there. And um, then I backed up a little bit further and recalled a, a joint um, lecture I had done with Maya Lin in 1985, pretty early on. But I had uh, just, um, I was then writing uh, on Holocaust memorials and thinking about them hard for the first time. And the Harvard School of Design had invited uh, me and her to come talk um, to frame their New England Holocaust memorial process. And she gave a, a wonderful talk uh, on the Vietnam Veterans Monument. <clears throat> and um, of course, I was just enthralled. I'm, I still am with the monument itself. And uh, I spoke on Holocaust memorials, and, and we talked about our mutual preoccupations. And then at dinner that night, <clears throat> she said, well, you know, I, I have a confession to make, that the Vietnam Veterans Monument um, is indebted to two great monuments in France. Um, one is uh, Luton's uh, memorial at the Battle of the Somme, this gigantic triangular black wall inscribed with names. And the other, she said, and maybe even more important for me, when I was a junior at Yale, she said, uh, I was spending a semester abroad, she would visit every day the crypt on the Ile de Licite uh, in Paris, right uh, 
in front of or behind uh, Notre Dame, uh, the memorial to uh, France's deported Jews, the memorial to the deporté, as they politely called it there. And uh, she said that uh, even though that was designed in the 1950s, the 1955 or 56 it was dedicated, um, I was never the same since. And I found that all my forms uh, somehow are traceable to this descent into a place where the horizons close around you. And um, taking these materials, these very unyielding materials on the one hand, and have, having to find your place within it. And then she said something that um, just always, you know, it just struck such a chord in, in its poetry. She goes that, since then, my job as kind of a memorial designer, whenever I was asked to think about these things, my job was to carve out a space in the landscape that would open a space within us for memory. And I just love that formulation to carve out that space in the landscape which would open up the space within us to remember and to contemplate these events. And in fact, that's what she did uh, in Washington, D.C., um, where she won this competition as a 21-year-old senior uh, at Yale, an architecture student who designed this uh, for the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Competition, uh, one of 1,000, over 1,000 blind submissions, and for which she received um, a B at Yale. <laughs> it's never good enough at Yale, is it? Nothing's ever quite good enough. Um, <clears throat> later, she was invited to join the uh, board of trustees at Yale, and she demanded of her professor that he change her grade, <laughs> and he still wouldn't budge. <laughs> but it comes back to this because, in fact, it's clear that Michael Arad is indebted to Maya Lin, and it was also clear as I worked in Germany that every one of the younger German artists and architects I worked with on these so-called counter monuments, or I didn't work with them on them, the ones that I was uh, trying to, uh, uh, whose histories I was trying to tell, were all indebted to Maya Lin. <clears throat> so I would like here just to um, put, kind of put up on the screen these forms and to discuss kind of the, the evolution of a kind of a memorial form uh, challenged in Germany for very particular reasons I'll get into, um, including um, one that I think um, will finally come back and address some of Samantha Power's questions last night. Um, there was a moment which I just wanted to jump up because she got something exactly right, in which um, a contemporary generation in Germany uh, is kind of obsessed with the notion not just of Monumentality is very much a, a kind of a Nazi kind of architecture or, or art, gigantic monoliths, um, uh, turning everybody into passive by, bystanders, turning everybody into kind of meek spectators. But um, they worry, in fact, that all this work on memorials is in some ways taking the place of intervention in contemporary unfolding genocides. And um, uh, I've told the story before, I think maybe even here, uh, nine years ago when I visited um, of watching uh, President Clinton uh, listen to Elie Wiesel's dedication speech uh, for the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum in April 1993. And uh, watching as uh, Elie uh, Wiesel paused right in the middle of his dedication speech and he looked back over his shoulder at uh, President and Mrs. Clinton and said, but before I begin, or before I continue, Mr. President, I have to tell you that I can't sleep at night for what my eyes have seen in Bosnia and Herzegovina. You must do something, Mr. President, to stop the genocide in Bosnia-Herzegovina. And then uh, I watched this on TV, and uh, the camera panned to uh, the president, and his, he clenched his jaw, and his eyes watered, and, and it went back to Wiesel's speech. But then I, I heard him say something he didn't say, and I, I heard him say, but, but Ellie, um, I am doing something about Bosnia-Herzegovina. I'm here with you remembering the Holocaust. He said, no, that's exactly backwards, Mr. President. You remember the Holocaust as a spur to intervention, not as a substitute for it. That's not what he was doing or thinking, but, but that possibility in the contemporary memorial making process where it becomes all process and no action, it becomes all displaced action, if you will, is something that um, really does continue to bother a new generation. And which of course is a very different, um, is something that would preoccupy German artists and historians and, and architects um, in a way is very different from the, the American story in New York City. So I don't mean to yoke these two processes together arbitrarily, um, but I do want to show um, how particular forms have been inflected by particular preoccupations, what I will call post-Holocaust preoccupations. So with that, maybe let me begin with 
a few of the images, uh, which will be quite familiar to you, I think. This is the memorial to the deporté in, in, in Paris. <clears throat> the architect Henri Pangusson designed basically a motif around triangles, uh, the triangle figures uh, denoting uh, in, his, um, uh, in, in his descriptions the triangles that political prisoners wore uh, in the concentration camps. <clears throat> As you approach kind of the stairs to go down into it, there is something bunkerish, even a little bit um, figurative and you know, God forbid, representational in the uh, reference to the uh, gas chamber stairs, perhaps. This wasn't what Maya Lin was thinking about when she went down. She was talking about the, this, the space being cut into the earth, <clears throat> and in a funny way, um, some, some life being squeezed out of us as we went down, some hope uh, disappearing as we, as we descend into these space, the space. These triangular figures um, kind of everywhere here denoting or you know, suggesting obliquely perhaps barbed wire on the one hand or the triangles worn by the victims on the other. Each of the triangles here with the name of a concentration camp um, in them. These are just kind of parts of that memorial in Paris. By the way, it was this memorial's dedication, I think in 1955 or 1956, which um, spurred um, the Israeli Knesset uh, into uh, the, its final gallop to complete Yad Vashem. <laughs> they, were, they were furious that Paris and France now seemed to have a national Holocaust memorial, while Israel still did not at Yad Vashem. And looking out to the Seine uh, through this kind of this, uh, this grid, it's abstract. On one hand, um, you've had to descend as opposed to ascend. This isn't a, a triumphal monument of any sort. It is, it's very much a, a negative form. Um, and then Maya Lin's uh, first pastel, uh, which she submitted for the design competition for the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. And in its, I mean, absolute elegance um, and kind of minimalist aesthetic, it's very, very light hand. It did attract the attention of just one juror. Nobody else got it. The one juror pulled it up through every stage, every stage, because he couldn't bear to leave it behind until finally he had it up into one of the very last stages and everybody got to sit with it and look at it. And, um, and the, the vets on hand uh, agreed that in looking for a form that might best articulate the great ambivalence America and Americans felt toward their veterans, the great ambivalence that veterans felt about their own experiences in the war and their great experience, their, the ambivalence they felt about coming home and being reviled by an American public, that all of this kind of this ambivalence did find expression in this negative form. She meant to counterpoint all the Washington, D.C. Uh, conventional white neoclassic obelisk style monuments with something black cut into the ground. It was meant to be um, a, a scar, if you will. One axis pointing toward the Washington Monument, the other one pointing toward the Lincoln Memorial. <clears throat> um, it was very much a, um, a compass uh, embracing the Washington Wall, very American monument on the one hand, but instead of ascending to something, you descend, of course. And as you descend into it, you're, you come face to face with your, 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 your own reflection and the names carved on the walls. The names are carved on the walls in uh, uh, chronological order, not in alphabetical order. It's not a telephone book, but it's the names are carved in such a way as to tell a story, the, the story, the chronology of their deaths. <clears throat> The memorial isn't meant to dominate you. It's not meant to kind of um, uh, oppress you in some ways and make you feel small or diminish you know, your own humanity in some ways, but it, 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 it forced you to come face to face with kind of human purport, humanly proportioned forms, and it's in the reflection here. You look in, it, it could also become a little bit about yourself. I mean, you, know, you look in and it becomes, um, you, know, you become the rememberer for, for for whom you search. 
It became a, a repository. There was something inviting in it. Uh, the, you know, the bottles of Jack Daniels, the, the medals, <coughs> all the, the, the hats, the boots, all the tank bears, all the things left behind by visitors are now um, accumulated into a gigantic archive in Washington, D.C., the parks, which the Park Service runs. And there's a very much a sense of, um, as you, you descend, and I've talked to veterans who feel as they descend into this, they actually feel like they're, they're entering, in some ways, the, graves, the grave of their fallen buddies. Uh, but unlike their buddies who stay there, they come back out the other side. And they do feel a little reborn, a little Lazarus-like. And I've heard this repeated over and over again by uh, several of the several vets um, I've interviewed around this. So this was dedicated in um, 1980. Is that right, Kenny? That sounds right. The competition of the 79, dedicated in 80, 81, I think. <clears throat> and just in time, uh, sorry? 89. No, no, way, way before. I think uh, 1981, I believe. Yeah. <clears throat> so now a generation in Germany is also wrestling with its own, um, its own resistance to, to the monumental, uh, the, the gigantic model is telling people what to think, what they regard as an authoritarian form of architecture. And so in the 1995 competition uh, for uh, Europe's uh, uh, Germany's memorial to Europe's murdered Jews, Horst Hoheisel proposed taking Germany's national monument, the Brandenburger Tor, and uh, blowing it up. <clears throat> um, rather than commemorating one destruction with the construction of an edifice, you get rid of the national memorial altogether. One destruction is now commemorated by another destruction. The absence being commemorated is, is now commemorated with another absence. Not represented by it, but I mean, it, I, I, I loved... Um, uh, Robert's explanation of the music this morning, embodying it. But that's the question. How do you embody an absence? How do you articulate a void without filling it in? And that is what these artists are wrestling with. And I'm not, I can't tell you how. I can only show you how they attempt to wrestle with that question. The Brandenburger Tor is going to be ground to dust. The dust will be <clears throat> spread on the area of the memorial. The area will be converted, uh, covered with granite plates. At the memorial, <clears throat> two blank voids are created. It's double voids, and this is the actual memorial. It's hard to stand it, <clears throat> but it almost shows the impossibility of expressing the Holocaust by means of art. Almost shows. It doesn't even mean that suggesting that it can show, but it attempts to show. It's trying to work it through. And so what it would do is actually create the space in the landscape for the visitors who come to visit, whereby they would then look within themselves for the memory you know, for which they search. This memorial, yeah, I wrote about a long time ago, and, and uh, this is quite familiar to most of you now, I'm sure, um, by Esther and um, Jochen uh, Gerritz, uh, who designed this 12-meter tall lead column um, covered in soft lead and invited uh, visitors to add their names to ours. As more and more names cover this, uh, this column, uh, it will be lowered into the ground. <clears throat> One day it will disappear completely, <clears throat> and the site of the Harburg Monument against fascism <clears throat> will be empty. In the end, it is only we ourselves who can rise up against injustice. And I love this last phrase. In the end, it is only we ourselves who can rise up against injustice. All this monument making is not rising up against injustice. It's not protecting us. It's not, it's not uh, ensuring never again. Only we rise up. And there's a funny way in which, in the end, the only people left standing here to remember, the only standing forms will, those, will be those who came looking for, for memory. Now they look within themselves, and only they can stand up against injustice. Don't make your monuments do it for you. And I, that, that suspicion, that skepticism, I do believe is embodied in this whole, all of these you know, kinds of counter monuments. So at the beginning, of course, the local citizens did add their names in nice, neat little rows. But before long, the whole thing was covered in this uh, scribble scrabble of graffiti, um, swastikas, uh, marker pen. And the town said, but this is horrible. What the, this, is, this is a kind of a desecration. This is no way to, you know, to, to remember um, you know, the Holocaust or, or the victims of fascism. And the artist said, well, doesn't every monument basically just reflect back to the community its own preoccupations? This is kind of a screen onto which you project your relationship to this time and this past. And if, uh, isn't the swastika, too, a kind of signature? 
And uh, the town had to answer yes, in fact, it was. And so little by little, as a meter and a half sections were covered, the pillar was lowered into the ground. It was dedicated in 1986, and it was finally lowered all the way into the ground. <coughs> Let's see if we can focus. Can we focus that a little bit? Uh, thanks. A little bit more. Okay. Oh, that one. That one's lost. Finally, in 1993, um, it was um, it was lowered into the ground. Uh, not coincidentally, on uh, November 9th, 1993. Uh, again, that great, if you will. Uh, black hole of a national holiday uh, in Germany, um, which seemed to attract in some uh, calendrical way uh, all kinds of great and terrible events. It, 19, uh, November 9, 1923 was the date of the Hitler's putsch. Um, in 1938, of course, commemorated with, the, with Kristallnacht. <clears throat> and um, uh, actually in 1918, it was the day Wilhelm abdicated the crown. And then 1989, uh, it was the day the wall, Berlin Wall fell uh, as well. So it was orchestrated in order to come down on that day as well. Let's see. There we go. You know, now, now empty. So the, here the memorial, uh, this counter monument, seemed to challenge all of the conventional premises. Instead of remaining pristine, it invited its own uh, violation, its own desecration. And instead of kind of towering over the cowering visitor, it would now basically um, disappear altogether, uh, the visitor could actually get rid of it by active participation. Um, it did reflect back, in fact, this funny, um, this tortured relationship the Germans had in the past. How to remember something they might rather forget, they got rid of their, their anti-fascist monument. After this, Joachim Gertz went to Zarbrücken, where he taught a course on monuments. Uh, <clears throat> to a class, he uh, swore to secrecy. Half the class went out and picked, uh, stole cobblestones from around the town, brought them back to the classroom where the other half of the class researched, was researching all the names of every last destroyed Jewish cemetery in, in Germany between 1933 and 1945, some 2,160 uh, cemeteries. And then they carved the names of each of these cemeteries on a, the cobblestone, and then at night they went back and they replaced these cobblestones in the square, you know, kind of a guerrilla memorial action. But of course, this is Jochen Gertz, so they replaced the stones inscribed side down so that there's no, there's no trace of the entire operation. And then they invited townspeople to come and to see the monument. Uh, this memorial is now dubbed, of course, the Plaza of the Invisible Memorial, uh, 2,160 stones against racism. Um, when the townspeople came down, the students gathered around and said, uh, you, you, know, you have become the memorial for which you search. Look within yourselves. And this is very much um, the work of an artist preoccupied with self-effacement as an artist. Jochen Gertz used to say in the 60s that uh, the only art he wanted to make would be that art which would come to exist inside, that everything he made he wanted destroyed as soon as it was seen and somehow in internalized you know, by those who come to watch it. It's a particular kind of art. It's also an anti-commercial anti art. The self, there was a, a time in the 60s and 70s when there was lots of self-destructive art which could not be commodified, which couldn't be put in galleries, you know, for example. Uh, Jochen Gerritz had also created works of art uh, written in chalk, gigantic kind of manifestos in chalk on effacement and art uh, would open the gallery doors and they would come in and of course brush off the entire show on their way to drink the wine at the back of the room. And, and he watched as this would happen. And so this was, the, it was a, again, a preoccupation you know, by this artist and uh, artists in his generation with effacement, the void, the absence, the loss, and the irredeemability of such loss, the inability to compensate it. Of course, Tolheisel, who had proposed blowing up the Brandenburger Tour in 1986, he had proposed another memorial uh, for Kassel uh, to the Aschrodbrunnen, the uh, Aschrod fountain in Kassel, uh, donated to the town uh, by a local uh, Jewish philanthropist, and which was destroyed by the Nazis in 1938 as the so-called Jews Fountain. Uh, the town wanted to replace it, but Hoheisel said, no, let's take its form and dig it into the ground. It will become now a negative form. This will now become not a place where you know, the, water, you know, the, the water sprays above, but it will become a place where the water actually sinks into the ground 
um, when people come here, I want people to be the only standing forms. And he did this exactly at the same moment at, with the Har at which the Harburg Monument was being dedicated. And at that, at that time, they did not know each other. They didn't know this was going on. But it was very much this preoccupation. And subsequently, both artists credited Maya Lin with this the, with this, uh, this, um, the, with their attempts to formalize the negative space <clears throat> and to make that negative space somehow uh, a, a motif around which the um, around which loss and absence would would, um, would now be remembered. This is another project I won't go into here. Just to, I'm actually showing these just to give you some context for the the Berlin Memorial Competition. Can we try to focus this a little bit? Thanks. At the Babelplatz in Berlin, um, a, a square actually I, I crossed every day on my way to deliberations around the Berlin Memorial, uh, Misha Ullmann, an Israeli artist, <clears throat> won the competition for the uh, Berlin book burning uh, uh, memorial. And of course, instead of, say, a figurative statue or statuary somehow of uh, burning books or flames, he proposed uh, building a, uh, a room, an empty uh, room of shelves below the Babelplatz. On either side of the window looking into this room, the window's in the middle, but on either side uh, there's a, a steel tablet in the ground, one describing the book burnings in, um, uh, on this site in 1933, March, uh, April 1933, and then 1934. And then the other with a simple inscription by Heinrich Heine um, you know, from some 150 years earlier, uh, where books are burned, so too one day will people be burned as well. And again, preoccupied by the inability, not the inability to represent, not the inability to remember, but the, the inability to remember without somehow compensating. He made this room the only positive forms in the square are those now who come looking. And this is what they see when they look down. Can we focus a little bit? Thanks. Yep. <clears throat> and so what they see is just a room of empty shelves. The destroyed books, not to be placed, gone forever. Can't be redeemed, can't be compensated, can't be filled in. And of course, many of the authors of the books, you know, gone forever uh, as well. And, uh, and, and just that simply, I mean, um, uh, but it was also significant that it was important that the, the books themselves somehow be commemorated as now missing and unrecoverable. This book motif uh, was um, also kind of in play in Vienna when Rachel Whiteread won the competition for Vienna's Memorial to the Holocaust. To uh, see so you can focus that too. Um, she won a, a competition uh, unanimously uh, with her her form, which is again based very much in her work, and you know, we've talked about this in lots of other contexts. You know, when Art Spiegelman goes to you know, tell his father's story um, and his relationship to it, he tells it in his, in his medium, his vernacular, which happens to be comics. Um, when uh, musicians go to respond, they do it in their in their medium. Rachel Whiteread had already been hard at work on, in her words, trying to suggest that um, the. Uh, the materiality of absence, that material might be regarded as an index of absence somehow. So she won the Turner Prize in 1984 in England for having filled in a row house with concrete, then pulling all the, 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 the walls and everything away to leave only the, if you will, the, the inner space of that house now concretized, literally, you know, reified. And, um, and that became her, again, her, her preoccupation. Here, she wanted you know, to take this a, a step further and to suggest that the people of the book be remembered in a bookish motif, a library, Bibliothek once again, the same, uh, naming it the same as Michel Ullmann did in Berlin. She took um, the space of the, uh, between the leaves of the book and the walls, <clears throat> almost like a, if you will, a library turned inside out with the space being the only shell remaining. And that was her, this is her motif. It's a, yeah. like. Um, it uh, raised lots of controversy, um, but in its light-handedness again, um, it, it, it carried the day. Robert Storr uh, wrote the opinion for it as the, um, the, the head of the jury. 
But of course, when they went to install it, they found that um, in doing excavations uh, there that they, um, they discovered um, uh, the reason that this site, the Judenplatz, was already called the Judenplatz. Of course, it was the site of an auto de fe, a pogrom in 1421, in which the synagogue on the site was filled with local Jews and set afire, uh, killing, killing them all. And uh, there was no memorial to that except for the name Judenplatz here. But on a, the, a tapestry in a nearby church, there was, in fact, a, a commemoration of that, of that pogrom. But, but the explanation was in Latin and was, of course, um, an, uh, uh, it, it was um, uh, an apology in some ways, in which it said, um, here on the site in 1421, the crimes of the Hebrew dogs, um, uh, the, the flames of hate rose up against the Hebrew dogs to punish them for their crimes. <laughs> that was the memorial that we had for the Judenplatz at that point. So they made room. They moved over the Rachel, Rachel White Reed's um, the, the cenotaph, if you will, and, uh, and made room now for the excavated ruins of the synagogue as well. The ancient persecution now uh, with, the, with the more contemporary one right next door to it. Focus. And then, of course, Shimon Ati's uh, wonderful um, kind of wall projection. Can we focus? That should come into focus. <clears throat> in which he also, when he visited Berlin in 1990, um, in East Berlin in particular, he found that uh, he was struck by what was missing. Now, what was missing, of course, was any sign of the Jewish immigrants, most of the most Jews coming from Poland in the 20s, uh, stateless Jews. Um, and he knew they lived um, uh, by the thousands in this neighborhood, but not a, not a sign. So he went into the archives and found photographs of them, where they lived, what they did, their stores, their bakeries, their theaters took these photographs and went back <clears throat> um, with slides made of these photographs and at night then would project them back onto these sites in order to animate them with, with their own memory or with, in fact, with what he called his memory of what had been, once been here, suggesting again that these sites by themselves are uh, basically amnesiac. They don't remember anything except that which we project back onto them. And so he's, he did that. His relationship to these events, he said very clearly, are photographic. He knows only what he's seen in photographs. Now when he goes back, he's, he would be basically animating these sites with these images, hoping that as people would see them and then, and then um, disappear, come back and find the, the light gone, that the image itself would somehow uh, be retained on the back of their retina, that they would somehow internalize this. But again, the absence of any sign is what motivated him to kind of restore it, um, even as he knew it would be only ephemeral. But these are the kinds of projects um, which were quite, uh, I'd say quite common. Uh, there are dozens and dozens more like this throughout Germany. Um, and not all. I mean, Germany actually has done a great job preserving uh, the ruins of concentration camps, creating museums and education centers uh, you know, anchored in the, in the sites of destruction. But the younger generation, just the post-war generation, harbors such a deep distrust of the monumental as a form that this is the, the response now. To it, and that's why I call them, call them counter monuments. Um, if this is all there were, obviously it wouldn't be enough, but in a way it helps to balance exactly what happens on the sites with their preoccupation by what they're trying to do um, in these other sites. It, they work very well. Uh, let's see, I will <clears throat> go straight to the um, last three finalists <coughs> of the Berlin competition. Can we focus, please, oh, a little bit? Thanks, Mike. Um, this by Daniel Liebeskent, the architect who designed the Berlin Jewish Museum, or what was at first called the Jewish Museum Extension to the Berlin Museum. Um, of course, that museum uh, is based on a system of six voids serving as kind of these axes throughout. Liebeskent basically extended one of the voids uh, all the way into the site here. This is the site chosen by the Berlin uh, government, actually, for the memorial to Europe's murdered Jews. Um, a memorial itself, which was also partly instigated, I have to say, um, by uh, uh, Chancellor Kohl and President Reagan's ill-fated walk, stroll through the Bitburg Cemetery. And uh, Liebeskind has taken a wall here with as much missing as you know, included. Um, it, was, uh, it was interesting, except that there was also a sense that now one architect would kind of be named responsible for all this memory you know, going on in Berlin. This was much more interesting to us. Focus that, please. 
a little bit more. It's actually, it should be a pretty clear picture. There we go. Um, Gesina Weinmiller, a young uh, Berlin architect, submitted this. Again, think of the Vietnam Veterans Monument. <clears throat> the descent into a space opened up and it's you know, repeated yet again here. Um, it would be a sense in which she wanted the landscape, the cityscape of Berlin to kind of disappear as you went into the space, the walls themselves being about 25 feet high, 18 randomly, seemingly randomly scattered uh, segments of uh, limestone stacked wall uh, spread throughout to, to, again, refer somewhat indirectly, she hoped, um, to the stones of the Kotel or the Western Wall uh, in Jerusalem. And uh, from this corner all the way down here at the far right, um, we discovered on our own as we walked around the model that uh, as you approach that corner, these segments actually congealed into a kind of star of David. And as you walked away from it, it fell apart. So it was a little bit of a sense of a star coming together, then falling apart, uh, demanding in some ways the interaction of the visitors who came. And that struck us as possibly a little gimmicky, which um, you know, bothered us on the one hand, but it was something that unannounced people would have to find by themselves. So we did actually vote at first to accept this design. Yep, I'm not sure, it's just out of order. And then the other finalist with P was Peter Eisenman and Richard Serra's uh, massive uh, stone of, uh, field of stones, or uh, Stellefeld, um, uh, a, a field um, of some 4,200 uh, Stella ranging in size from uh, kind of uh, ground level to some 28 feet high. Um, it was clearly a dangerous place, which it was meant to be. Sarah said that uh, his work is often dangerous. Um, uh, Eisenman described this work as um, taking the form of, an, of individual mourning, the, the, the single, say, tombstone, and then collectivizing it in some way, but making it um, animate in this rolling topography. It would be like a kind of a rolling field of, of, of wheat, something alive, um, something very um, uh, uncertain and destabilizing so that as you walk through, in fact, you would never be able to see from one end all the way to the other that you would feel lost. So in principle, we like this. It was clearly an oppressive monument, um, but it was taking a traditional form and somehow multiplying it uh, in a way that you know, did, seem, did seem to work. In fact, you knew that something gigantic happened now on this five acre, not on this five acre site, but by this five acre site, um, which had now been um, designated by the state. And of course, this, this was around years and years of controversy, whether or not they should actually go through with it. Um, in the end, of course, um, I came aboard, but I was an early skeptic, suggesting that what was most important here was a long process, and to be very patient with the process. You know, it took 60 years for you to get to this point. It might take 60 more years to come up with a, a design, but not to be worried about the end result, but just to allow it to work through. And it was, of course, the kind of now somewhat infamous um, uh, recommendation I, I made, you know, better to have a thousand years of Holocaust memorial competitions than any final solution to your Holocaust memorial problem that brought, ha, that uh, kind of um, uh, had Peter Radunsky call me and ask me to, to come aboard. But I said, Germany has a very specific national conundrum, how to commemorate a people murdered in its name, how to reunite itself on the bedrock memory of its crimes. Nobody's ever done it before. Where on the mall in Washington, D.C., is there even a pebble denoting the slave auctions that were once held on that mall? No, not a mention. Nations never build themselves or their memorial cultures on the memory of crimes perpetrated in their name, but always on the memory of their martyrdoms or their great triumphs, perhaps but not on the memory of crimes perpetrated in the national name. And yet, Germany was attempting to do just this, and hence its tortured, uh, fraught process. So we came back with suggestions. <clears throat> Here's the, here are the pictures of the site before we started building. Um, there was uh, uh, eventually voted on uh, by the Bundestag, and uh, finally, um, uh, this, this design uh, was finally approved in three stages. We re made a recommendation to the Bundestag that they vote up or down whether or not they wanted a national memorial to Europe's murdered Jews, whether they wanted it on this site, whether they wanted Peter Eisenman and Richard Serra's design, and whether they would put a place of information underneath. That became a sticking point because with something so abstract as this, um, what was it going to be commemorating? That became very important. And so we anchored it with a document house underneath so that, in fact, the abstract memorial form above would now be anchored in very concrete historical narrative. 
Many people, including Stephen Greenblatt and others, suggested that uh, we leave this empty, that that become the memorial, the Great Void. This was the site of the memorial before, it was, while the wall was still standing. Um, Hitler's bunker is just up out of the picture, uh, of course, completely unmarked, only marked, I should say, by a, usually a small group of tourists looking for Hitler's bunker. And these were the models that Eisman came back after we asked him to scale it down. He said, you know what, in, theoretically, you're asking us to accept this as kind of what you would call a, a counter monument, something kind of um, resisting monumental you know, instincts and impulses, but in fact, this is huge. Um, it needs to be smaller. This will defeat viewers as they come into it, and it's also literally dangerous. So he scaled it down, but he did this without telling his partner, Richard Serra, who uh, withdrew angrily from the process when uh, Eisenman revealed uh, for the first time in the chancellor's office his new, his scaled down version. Sarah said, well, then the logic of it's not mine anymore. And he was exactly right. Eisenman now could take complete ownership of it. <clears throat> and it was voted up by the Bundestag and construction began almost immediately after uh, 1999. It's very important to remember here that as diff as politically fraught as the process was, <clears throat> that and it had become an election issue. Um, it, this was regarded by many in Germany as Helmut Kohl's memorial, something that he had done to kind of, uh, uh, in a, kind of an expiatory fashion <coughs> uh, to get out from underneath the Bitburg mess. Um, uh, so the, the SDP, <coughs> in particular, uh, Michael Nauman, who was going to be the culture minister for the SDP, um, didn't want any part of it. And so they made that an election issue. Um, when uh, the elections were finished, the SDP needed the uh, Joschka Fischer and the Green Party for a coalition, a governing coalition. Joschka Fischer, who became the foreign minister, agreed to come on board only if the memorial goes forward. <laughs> so the coalition was built on the basis of the memorial, which isn't all that widely known, but is a, is a crucial thing to remember because Joschka Fischer said, not only do we need the memorial, but we need to know why we have this memorial. And so later on in Kosovo, uh, uh, just on the edge of the the precipice of the eve of the, of the Kosovo crisis, he invoked this memorial. He goes, toward what end are we building this memorial in Berlin, if not to remind us to take action now? I mean, he, he put those things together very concretely. Otherwise, he said, we will always be accused of building memory as a substitute for action. So he used this as a basis for a change in policy. For the first time, uh, German soldiers were going to be allowed to exit German soil and to go into another European soil. Under construction, the forms it took. And in fact, things were straightened out. Um, they were reduced in size and scale from down to 2,711. Um, as many tractates are in the Talmud, the Talmud has told me, coincidentally, completely. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> chapter yeah. Meant to be underdetermined. Nothing's meant to be written on these. It's Im they're impregnated with um, anti-graffiti material. But the process unfolded finally because, in effect, it relaxed as process and was allowed to have uh, the, the space for it was given time and place. You can see its relationship. It's uh, basically right between the Potsdamer Platz, you know, to my back, to our back out here, and the Reichstag, and the Brandenburger Tor on the other side. And uh, it is a public space. Uh, it was designed and meant by the German government to be for Germans. And um, it's true that everybody's going to treat it differently. I don't think probably the survivors or their, or their children would probably come and stand on these. They would be so, they would literally take these more as gravestones in some way and they would treat them with that kind of respect. Um, but again, it's another, it's another public who's, who lives with this and around it now. It's a place of gigantic tours, instruction. They go from here to the document center. This is the document center entrance under construction. People coming out, all creeds, shapes, and sizes visiting. The Stella marking the stairs. And then seemingly, the Stella seemed to come through. They don't actually, it's an illusion created. Um, but 
Um, but there was a nice way in which they allowed this, um, the illusion of Stella coming all the way through so that literally they seem to be anchored in the story being commemorated here. And so it's a very clear historical record, you know, told in four rooms. You know, the rise of the Nazis, the, the actual killing process, an aftermath, and then a room for contemplation. These were models. And yes, complete with sunbathers and picnics. And, and of course, we were very worried about children running out, which is one of the reasons we scaled it down. But sure enough, they, they do run out over the tops. So with that, I'm going to make this bit of a jump here and uh, discuss kind of the, the reasons I agreed to come on board the Berlin process had a lot to do with my having to put my money where my mouth is in some ways. It became very easy to sit on the sidelines as an academic critic and say, uh, and talk about all the reasons for not doing this. In New York, um, on the other hand, this was something very close to home. This wasn't about uh, people remembering its own victims. This was about basically a city remembering its own victimization. And so I want to make that very clear to the, um, to, to the mayor and the governor in the very first discussions we had. And I said, in fact, um, don't worry about the memorial at all. Uh, and this I said literally two weeks after the, the attacks. Um, we don't know what the meaning is. And I don't know if we'll ever know what the meaning is. The only people who know what the meaning of the 9-11 attacks are are those people who lost somebody directly. For them, it is absolute loss of loved ones. What it means in the long term is going to take the long term to figure out. But if you want a memorial, now just open the process up, create a space for that process itself. And, and here I suggested that they begin to regard the memorial downtown in stages. <clears throat> so we put the um, other... And these stages would be regarded um, now as constitutive of the memorial. So don't wait for the final result. Don't worry about what it's going to be. Just think of it as, in a way, the, a memorial that probably seemed to begin in people's minds with the moment of the attacks, reflected in the faces of those who actually uh, remember the the. It, the the response of people to the attacks, the response of people to the memory of the towers and of the people who were lost, multiplied by millions and millions of people who saw these things uh, live on television. Can we focus? And I wish there is there an automatic or not, Mark? Thanks. And I said the very first memorials clearly were the candlelight vigils. <clears throat> you know, um, the very first night of the attacks. This was uh, Union Square. Washington Square had the same. Uh, the, the promenade in Brooklyn had the same. Thousands and thousands, thousands of candles. Um, the, the, there were many candles almost shaped like the World Trade Center towers. Many people regarded those as burning candles in the very beginning. There were all these artist renditions. There were competitions for memorial designs uh, within weeks of the galleries downtown. And again, these are, these are memorials, victims, families, memorials, or city dwellers who regarded themselves as victims of these attacks, looking for consolation, looking, not, if not for redemption, then some kind of repair, a very different process altogether from what would have been going on in Berlin, where the artists and architects wanted to do anything but redeem events with beauty, redeem events with fullness or repair. They wanted to leave these, you know, th these gaps uh, intact. And of course, the... Um, the posters, the councils, the thousands and thousands of flyers around the city would be the very first um, uh, epitaphs you know, to the victims. And again, the motif here becomes loss, missing. Have you seen my sister? Have you seen my father? Have you seen my brother, my mother? Everywhere you went in the city, these are, these are what you found. And so the victims' faces and identities now became the very first objects of memorialization, of, of commemoration, before they actually knew where they, where they were. But remember, missing, absent, lost, has now become what was in the family members' minds the, very, the, the predominant motif and preoccupation. For those who didn't actually know somebody, what was missing were the towers themselves. And so there was an early debate. Are we commemorating the destruction of the towers or are we commemorating the destruction of the lives inside the towers? What many people missed were not the people whom they didn't know, but they missed their two 
um, you know, somewhat reviled, in fact, uh, towers, but now they really missed them. They were gone. The landmarks were gone. It's Art Spiegelman's uh, great cover, New Yorker cover, uh, of uh, no towers. Basically, he took, there was a black cover with just, just the vaguest shadow of the two towers. And the moments of destruction, and now everybody thought, well, at every different stage, people said, this should be the memorial. And, and again, several of us uh, kind of counseled that don't look for the memorial. Think of the memorial encompassing all of these things, all of the stages. Think of the memorial in its own long durée, not in that, in that kind of concretized, closed down, fixed place in the landscape. So the repair, the destruction, people want to say, just leave it behind. That will be the memorial. Yes, it will be a memorial to the destruction. Will it commemorate the people's lives lost? Will it commemorate, will it create a place where regeneration takes place? No. The destruction alone would be basically as the, as the, as the killers, as the attackers, would have left New York to itself. At different stages of cleanup, they said, okay, we'll leave the facade. Many love that you know, facade. That will be the memorial, the, that moment of destruction. And, uh, and at every stage, it seemed to many people that that would be it. And, and it took some time for people to begin you know, to step back and to see all of these as part of an unfolding memorial. For the firemen, firefighters, this was kind of a natural memorial. After six months, on the six-month anniversary of the tax, it was a tribute in light, which first was called Towers of Light. but the a controversy arose. If it's Towers of Light, you mean you're just commemorating the towers? What about the people? No. We rename it to call it Tribute in Light, Tribute to the Victims, and leave it a little bit open, exactly what and whom are being commemorated here. The one-year anniversary, the memorial is basically in the commemorative, um, the ceremony uh, downtown, where all the victims' families read the names of their lost loved ones one at a time, after which they would file down and take a flower to put on one of two big reflecting ponds built just for this purpose. But one year later, you see the entire site is now cleaned all the way down to bedrock. And one after the other, people came down one at a time. Again, as a process with the victims being named. Again, this is a completely different time. Um, there, there was a time when, in fact, the attack would be regarded as a mass attack, but this was an attack of individuals and an attack against the country. It had been, um, depending on which group was commemorating, it was an attack um, against firefighters, against the police officers, against rescue workers, against just normal people going about their daily business, trying to earn, earn a living. The slurry walls here became very significant in the first uh, design uh, competition for buildings. And the design competition, not for the memorial, but for the new buildings to be built there, the new World Trade Center Tower, um, was, came down to two finalists. Uh, one, the think team with Rafael Vignoli and Frederick Schwartz and others uh, proposed these two almost scaffolding-like towers, almost the height of the original towers. Office built tower, office is only going up about uh, halfway though. commemorating um, well, lots of absence, lots, lots of loss, and in fact so much so that the governor, Pataki, in what is kind of a, a strange story, but um, as complicated as it got choosing between this design and Liebeskind's design, Pataki looked at this design, walked around it. Mm -hmm. this, that design, uh, including this, had been recommended by the LMDC uh, as, this, as the design to be chosen for the new towers. Um, but Pataki saw these. Now, look at this. They, they weren't asked to make memorials, but all these designs had memorial components. Here are the two footprints, completely articulated by gigantic retaining walls. Uh, you could enter them, in fact, um, and you would be inside gigantic voids, gigantic absences. But Pataki looked at these two and uh, said, um, well, this one looks like a skeleton. The families are going to hate it. I take the Liebeskind design. I mean, it was almost that that, you know, straightforward. So he overruled the LMDC's own inner committee and uh, took, chose this design, announced it before anybody could do it, because, in fact, he liked the story that went along with it. Liebeskind uh, 
uh, had a, a, a great narrative attached to it. Clearly, his um, asymmetrical spires uh, meant to echo the Statue of Liberty torch here. It was meant to be now the tallest building, 1,776 feet high. <clears throat> he also based it on what he called memorial foundations, the gigantic, empty, slurry wall bathtub at the, at the very bottom, which had been built uh, as a place actually to keep, uh, you know, as part of the landfill project to keep the, the waters out of the uh, harbor and the Hudson River. And uh, this is what uh, he said would be left behind un underneath, but it'd be, be completely below grade with two walkways, which would have been completely unserviceable. Um, but he was suggesting that both the memorial and this design all, all come together. All the while, um, the LMDC was planning a memorial design competition to complement the, the site design competition, even as the architects of the site design competition were including memorial elements. Liebeskind, even in his design, um, proposed putting a cantilevered cultural center uh, as part of the design, even though he wasn't asked to do this. So he overbuilt. And um, it was in April uh, 2003 that uh, the mayor and the governor appointed uh, me, Paula Grant Berry, Maya Lynn, Bartan Gregorian, uh, Michael Van Valkenburg, um, Enrique uh, Norton, and a no number of other, both from architects, cultural historians, to sit on this jury. Um, I agreed to do it only if Maya Lynn did it. She agreed only if I did it. And, um, and many already began wondering, is this going to be another gigantic Vietnam veterans monument? What's it going, what's it going to be? And I know that the, of the 5,201 designs that came in, many were spun modeled around the idea of the Vietnam Veterans Monument. By, uh, we had received 13,800 registrations for the contest um, from 90 countries. And by uh, July 1st, we now have 5,201 uh, designs uh, from 63 countries around the world. <clears throat> we were sequestered downtown. Uh, it took them a whole month to barcode every one of these, because this was to be a blind competition. And we were sequestered for the month of August, spent 12-hour days uh, looking at every single design on boards like this, pulling passion votes up, letting others go, voting at the end of the day to you know, leave some behind, but always leaving all of them accessible to go back and look to make sure we missed nothing. And of course, we saw every shape and design. I mean, I, um, that, that's, its, that's its own story, which I won't go into here because I'm interested in the process. But we had to reassure everybody at every step of the way to respect the process as a process and not to worry about the end result. And so that the, the end is a long ways in coming. We don't know what it will be. We don't know what it will mean. But create space, open up space for that process. Multiply the, the memorial work being done for any one of these designs by 5,201 times. And that's the number of hours of work already done by all of these designers, some on their kitchen tables, some in their you know, very high-tech uh, architectural firms, to arrive at a design. And then we have to find a way to put them all together, to show them all, so that the one built memorial doesn't come to basically occlude and negate everything else that was done. And that's still something that we're working on. We had meetings with the, the mayor and the governor, lunch meetings, again, in which we were there, just points of information. We talked about some of the things we'd seen. We just would keep them updated. And, um, and they basically reassured us that they would do nothing to get in the way, that Pataki, in particular, had to reassure us that he would not, at the very end, step in and choose it you know, for us. We said, we only agree to do this if we have the final word. We have to you know, live or die by our choice. If we can't end up with a, something uh, we, we can stand by, then we won't choose anything. But otherwise, you have to give us complete freedom you know, to do it. And they did. Bloomberg, in particular, was quite funny. This is Pataki, but Bloomberg took uh, Maya and me to lunch at the beginning of the process. And he wanted to hear everything, everything we knew, everything we thought about memorials. And at the end, he walked us back out and uh, patted us on the shoulder and said, uh, well, kids, you're probably the right ones for the job, but please, please don't screw it up. <laughs> the last words as he pushed us out the door. The jury, 
Um, the mayor gave us Gracie Mansion uh, for the last weeks of uh, deliberations, just turned it over to us, and we brought in the eight finalists, uh, one team at a time. We sent them back with recommendations. It was a very interventionist jury. Um, there were people in the jury, like Maya, like Michael Van Balkenberg, uh, Enrique Norton, who felt you know, they knew more than anybody else, and so they kind of sent these people back over and over again to refine um, promising projects. Much food and much wine consumed <laughs> to get us through. And the three finalists I just wanted to show you here, one was by a French team in which they uh, proposed planting over the entire site in uh, blooming fruit trees, leaving the footprints themselves, which are one acre squares, you know, they're 200 foot squares, uh, empty save for wildflower gardens. Now, it's something very appealing, clearly, to the landscape architects among, among us for this. And um, I recalled also the, um, you know, uh, the Tadeo Ando Green Network um, commemorating the Kobe earthquake of 1995 in which he took 2,000, uh, 250,000 blooming um, magnolias to commemorate uh, all the homeless and the killed uh, victims in the, of the earthquake and just created this whole network of green to commemorate the swatch of destruction uh, in Kobe. And um, I also recall the, um, the Jewish sections of certain Polish villages um, after World War II, which were now untouched. They were basically abandoned and destroyed by local looting, but then never touched again. And so these, these sections kind of grew up with um, brush, trees. So right in the middle of the Polish villages to this day, you'll find gigantic squares where the Jewish section had been only grown over. And that's the memorial. Is it there? But you know something happened here by this. But it got more and more complicated. The more we talked to them about it, <clears throat> the less you know, workable the design became. But one thing we always liked was the kind of the, the, um, the, the calendar year, the cycle, the natural cycle now incorporating in some kind of a, um, a pastoral way, death being incorporated now into the natural cycle, uh, something you had to tend, something you had to nourish, something you had to take care of to make come back every year. It would be both a memorial you know, site which would bloom, would blossom, you know, be full in the summers, and then die, and then do go dormant, as the natural cycle you know, would in a, in a lifetime. And this was very appealing uh, to us, but um, they made things very complicated with all kinds of underground uh, subterranean schemes we couldn't live with. Can we focus this? This was the other runner-up um, proposed by a German team which was so eye-catching, and it was meant in some ways to complement uh, Santiago Calatrava's uh, new transit center, uh, almost kind of the, the winged bird, you know, about to take off. Uh, they called it Memorial Cloud. It's, this is a gigantic glass, uh, system of glass tubes making almost like this glass uh, frozen pond uh, over the site. The footprints would have been planted over and sawed. Um, the design architects on the jury loved this. Um, all looking for a memorial logic resisted it, but it came down to dividing the jury almost 50-50. Uh, we were 7-6 uh, against this over and over until we began to argue. And I said, where is the memorial logic in it? And they said, well, it's meant to suggest the cloud of smoke and steam coming up just after. But it was so beautiful in a way and so spectacular that it absorbed the eye and didn't seem to create space within us. It was kind of eye absorbing. And that, that spectacle, I realized, was something that, that um, uh, was was not in accord with the, a memorial logic that we were looking for. So little by little, we worked toward the other finalists, this Michael Arad, who had brought on Peter Walker, um, a great landscape uh, architect, to uh, fill in. And um, it wasn't somebody that got added on. Without Peter Walker, this design would never have been chosen. Uh, Peter Walker filled in the the plaza of these two gigantic voids, what they called reflecting absence. These were early models, uh, which actually don't do justice to the kinds of trees and things he would plant. But um, he took the, the principle of the voids and then added what we might regard as a regenerative, um, uh, a regenerative complement to them, also increasing the voids with living things now, so that the depth and the volume of the voids would be increased by the trees. It would also be screened from the street. It was brought to city to city street level, which was crucial to us to kind of stitch back into the city, this thing, and not to create a giant pit in the city that people had to walk around. We wanted people to live in this as well as um, around it. This is kind of a cutaway. 
The voids themselves are further by uh, another void at the very center, um, increased by the trees up on top. <clears throat> Underneath, you'd be able to go down and look to see the sky through these kind of wall falling veils of water. And at the North Tower, um, the, at bedrock, it would be open actually to the sky, um, and there would be a, kind of a, a commemorative vessel there. The actual remains of unidentified victims would be buried in a wall right next to it, but this would be kind of a, a, a commemorative vessel, supposedly with um, remains in it, which won't have any real remains in it. But it would be accessible only to the victims of the, um, of the victims' families. So as stages go, you know that the, the World Trade Center's design, site design, actually has now evolved over time. As David Childs has come aboard, the, um, uh, Skidmore Owens has done a complete you know, reworking of the design. Liebeskind has now taken a minority stakeholder's role uh, in, this, in this process. This, I believe, is the latest version of the tower itself. Other towers have now been added to it. Now all of them built to respond to the memorial. So in the beginning, there was only the first tower, the memorial was it was designed in some ways to respond to it, but now the other surrounding ones are built to respond to the memorial. <clears throat> and all of this actually um, gets put in perspective uh, for me in these conversations with families in which um, a large part of the time we spent deliberating. We didn't deliberate with the families, but we sat for several blocks of time just listening to the family stories, being informed by them without being lobbied by them, which is a, a pretty subtle distinction. But it was important uh, actually to know with some certainty what was being commemorated. And these were the people lost both on Flight 93 at the Pentagon, September 26, 1993, in the first World Trade Center bombing, and those killed on the site on September 11, 2001. So I, I took my two boys up to the family room in the LMDC office <clears throat> just to, to look as the cleanup was going on. And um, the site was interesting to them, but they were, they're kind of overwhelmed by the emptiness of the site and the, and the kind of the, the totality of destruction. But then they, they began to see the, all the, um, the, the artifacts, the, the, the letters that families wrote, the photographs, the teddy bears, the things, again, that families brought to populate this room a place for them to come and be consoled, that this was a place both to be consoled and to be reminded of loss. And just as we could be, you know, the families might be consoled with each other up in this room as they looked out on this gigantic site of destruction, the boys now put together that this was a place of both. And in some ways, um, this is what we ended up with, a, a, a double-sided monument that both would be regenerative in a way that the Berlin process never could have been, uh, ever, in the eyes of the young German artists uh, and architects, um, but also a site of irreparable loss, a site to build around. And um, so these are both the differences and the ways that, in fact, architecture has been inflected by the memory of genocide in ways that even now begin to shape for us the memory of completely non-genocidal events like 9-11. Uh, with that, I just thank you so much for listening, and I'll take questions. Oh. to ask about the monument for the, uh, for the murdered Jews of Europe in Berlin. And in a way to ask, uh, I mean, I very much appreciate the monument. I think it's very important. And uh, it, it, it reminds a lot of people there of, of, of history and so on, people who might happen upon it and might not otherwise run across it. But I, in my own experience, it's a kind of a naive, it, it's a question based on a naive exper experience of the, of the monument. That well, it, that's to say a real experience. Yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah. but I mean, not a, not a ref right. particularly reflected right. one. Um, so being there, um, uh, I was troubled by, you know, the children, play, the, whole, the whole aspect of living with, you know, mm -hmm. children playing, using it as a playground and so on. And um, it, it, it seemed to me like it's, I understand the, the idea is to integrate it into life so people are living with this memory, 
but the question is, how do you distinguish between, or how, are you, how, how is one certain that, uh, that a working through occurs rather than a repression? Mm -hmm. That's really basically the question. Sure. Or how do you think about, and how do you think about the complexities around, around that? Yeah, well, it's a great question. I don't know <clears throat> if there's a lot we can do about it, um, short of enforcing a decorum at a place like that, and wondering even to what extent decorum itself is a, is a repression <laughs> um, and a holding back somehow. Um, putting armed sentries around the memorial would, of course, you know, recall the camps themselves. Maybe, maybe that's one way to go. I mean, people have suggested it, of course. There was an early project by Jochen Gerritz um, uh, called the, the, the Dachau Project, I think 1977, which I talk about in the, at Memory's Edge, <clears throat> in which he was struck on his first trip to Dachau uh, in, the, in the 60s after the Dachau was turned into a camp, a concentration camp memorial site. Um, of all the rules, <clears throat> Um, no talking, no smoking, no dogs, no babies. And, and he, on reflection, he said, well, basically, um, it's kind of funny the way that um, the logic of the memorial seems to be just an extension of the logic of the concentration camp, telling us what to do, how to think, how to behave. And, and he rebelled. That was his first rebellion against the idea of the conventional memorial, in effect, that there was something authoritarian in that, you know, in that kind of code the Memorial Code of Decorum. Um, Eisenman knew that there was going to be, as a public space, this was going to invite graffiti, crime, all kinds of terrible possibilities. It's in a very well-traveled part of Berlin, as you know. You almost have to pass it if you're going between um, uh, any two parts of um, you know, Berlin on this side of Mitte. And um, he said, well, what I'll do, I'll, I'll create um, a solution. Uh, you will find a solution to impregnate in the stella themselves so the graffiti can be washed off. But our suggestion as a jury was that that's fine as long as you leave the graffiti there for one week and then take it off. Let this place reflect back to people how they live with it. Let them be shamed by it or inspired by it. But that, too, is part of the memorial's life. And if it becomes a, a place that, in fact, people revile, that they hate so much that they either refuse to visit or they kind of enact violence against it. Let that too, let this space be too uh, for that. And that will actually show us how we remember, whether we like it or not, or how the Germans remember and, and relate to this. Um, for the most part, the behavior is pretty respectful and quiet, but the kids will do what they, what they do. Um, I'd like to see parents probably talk to the kids a little bit. Um, but again, uh, short of setting up rules of decorum, it becomes very, very, very difficult. All of these levels, I mean, the memorial makers themselves would suggest that within the memorial process, there is also repression. That this, much of this memory is, memorial building is a displacement for memory work perhaps not being done otherwise. Hi, um, I wrote my question down because I have the memory of a goldfish. So, um, in your essay on memory, counter memory, and the end of the monument, you write that the monument displaces memory and supplants it with a material form. In addition, you write that the monument enables us to divest ourselves of the obligation to remember. Do you feel that this holds true for other visual representations? such as documentary or fictionalized films of the Holocaust or the Holocaust Museum? And if so, how should the second or subsequent generations remember? Actually, I, I uh, wrote those words um, summarizing the, the, um, the sentiments of many of the artists and architects in Germany who feared that the monument displaced as much memory as it might embody, et cetera. So, um, I was trying actually to report on what I was hearing mm -hmm. from these artists and architects to explain the kinds of forms that they were now proposing, you know, to to kind of push back against, <clears throat> you know, the conventional uh, you know, ideas about memorials. No, I, I think that um, all of these things uh, they're they're all necessary. I mean, the the, the museums are necessary, the paintings. Um, it's not actually. Um, I, I don't think it should be any of our roles, in fact, to begin uh, prescribing uh, whether or not it should be done. It has been done. We know it can be done. Whether we think it's adequate or not is another question. We you know, can all talk about that. But um, 
these are all re the responses of um, of cultures to catastrophe in their in their midst, and these are ways that uh, whole nation states make meaning of events. The generation that um, that I write about is is interested in in questioning some of the motives that had been uh, heretofore kind of unquestioned. That um, nations basically use these sites to tell narratives, you know, narratives about themselves, suggesting that the monuments in their midst are as true and as natural as the stones and trees and everything else, when in fact they're made by human beings in very human times and whose meanings last about as long as the generation who built them. And so that's, that's all this generation is trying to do. They're not saying they shouldn't be done, um, but they want to counter some of the very, uh, what they regard as kind of um, unreflexive tendencies in monuments and our relationships to them with monuments that kind of push back uh, a little bit. So there's room actually for, for both kinds. And if there were only one or the other, uh, then I think that would be a shame. So, okay. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, I this is a somewhat different question. I think that one of the interesting tensions or problems in the conference is how to bring together sort of uh, public space discourse and academic theoretical discourse. And uh, this is a question based on your own work, and it may be a misrepresentation that you want to uh, correct. Uh, I think that your first uh, work, uh, Writing and Rewriting the Holocaust, was really very much inspired by Hayden White and a kind of radical constructivism in the understanding of the way the past is fashioned and refashioned through narrative, whereas your later work really departs from that, uh, I think, rather drastically and is much more attuned to people's experience, uh, accurate representation, and at times a kind of hesitancy about theory, uh, questioning theory. Even when you invoke psychoanalytic mm -hmm. concepts, you don't want to indicate any kind of commitment to psychoanalysis. No, I wouldn't want to reify those in my critiques, it's, right. it's true. Well, I, I appreciate that, Dominic. In fact, um, you're right. I, I, don't, I don't, still don't resist theory. And in the classroom and in my writings, and some of them, you know, like uh, toward a received history of the Holocaust and other places where I've actually tried to look for the possibilities of middle voicedness, again, based a little bit on, on Hayden's work, wanting to find ways that which in, within narrative, <clears throat> in fact, uh, that we can have positive historiography, which contains uh, some of the, I guess, some of those um, uh, caesuras and silences and uncertainties, you know, without constantly instantiating, you know, meaning over and over and over again. And so the tension is there, but probably without resolution, because I'm not sure how, how to do it. Even, you know, Saul Friedlander suggests that Art Spiegelman's mouse is the only place he knows, you know, where, you know, deep memory at least gets gestured toward, you know, in some way at the very end. You know, it, it takes that co-mixture of image and narrative. Um, the memorials I, I came to, I came to within a literary study. Um, I sat down in, in archives at Auschwitz and, and Warsaw and suddenly was struck by the materiality of the artifact before me. Um, I was working with some of the scrolls buried in, in cans by the Zonderkommando. And I, I realized that I couldn't write about what they said and about how they meant without also referring to where they came from, the ground from which they seemed to come, uh, their, their artifactual basis. That that too was an historical fact. It was the fact of these ar archives, the fact of their, the, the fact of their particular information, even their misapprehensions, those two are historical facts. The misapprehension is too also a fact. And that I allowed myself, perhaps somewhat promiscuously, to write about all of it, not in a continuum, but to think about each one in its own generic way. But I was then allowed and invited by you know, others to let my eye wander from the page you know, to the buildings, to the topography, to the national narratives, and to try to make as much sense as I could. But I could no longer ignore that experiential part. And of course, my own position in it you know, being right there. I mean, perhaps I would do get overabsorbed in that material, the tactile part, even to call something the texture of memory is to suggest a tactile you know, material part of it that um, I hope doesn't evade theory and, and, or avoid the work I've done, you know, kind of on narrative. But um, it did take it in another direction, which seemed to, um, seemed to be embraced to a certain extent, you know, in an art historical and architectural community, waiting to hear, you know, think a little bit about it in these terms. And I, so, it, but it, I think it is a problem when I begin to write for larger and larger audiences. Perhaps the more, the larger the audience, the fewer people in some ways are going to find kind of penetrating, you know, theoretical um, um, content. So, so thank you. Thanks, That's good. Uh, James, thank you. Thank you for a wonderful lecture. Um, I thought you wonderfully 
described how Maya Lin's Vietnam Memorial became the kind of basis in people's thinking and formal vocabulary for subsequent work. One of the things that happened with the Vietnam Memorial was things that she didn't anticipate. And the fact that people, that it ended up being such a dramatic ritual site for people who visit and all the artifacts that people brought to it, which the Park Service then didn't know what to do with and now they collect and archive. And I think that too has become a common memorial practice now, I think largely based on that, that people bring things to that. So I ask the question really as a landscape architect and someone who teaches design, we always have the question as designers of trying to anticipate what pe how right. people will behave and how people will experience something. And I'm curious as a juror <laughs> in both of these competitions, particularly the World Trade Center one, have there been discussions of the anticipation of how people will behave and treat this clearly as, as a sacred and ritual site? We do, and, and you do as an architect also, but we have to recognize the, what we can't know. Um, there's a great principle I help build into um, both these processes that we want to choose a design which will uh, accommodate every new generation's own reasons for coming to it. It's a nice lofty way to describe something, something underdetermined, probably. Um, what that looks like, <laughs> uh, what, what that is going to mean in practice is something very, very difficult to say. We'll know when it doesn't work if we see it, but we don't know what it might be. So I guess it's just leaving open the possibility for um, completely unexpected and unanticipated uh, interactions with people, knowing that these two will be part of that memorial's life and possibly part of its eventual death in the, in the public mind. Um, that there is no such thing perhaps as a, a, a culturally eternal site with fixed meaning that over time, these things will change as they get dragged into new times with new generations. So Thank thanks you. so much. It's a, a question that um, I'd love to be able to answer, but I can't. <laughs> discussed how Mylan's uh, Vietnam Veterans Memorial opened up this descendants into the earth as a new sort of novel spatial and aesthetic experience um, in a memorial landscape. If you felt that that, how much importance is based on that aesthetic experience versus or just in comparison to any uh, alliteration it might have into um, the mythology or, you know, near universal sentiment of descendants and emergence in religions and mythology, which, mm -hmm. which one of those aspects you felt really was an informing one or maybe what you've seen from your experience? Well, it gets picked up in different ways. And, you know, in Israel, the Holocaust, early Holocaust <laughs> memorial museums um, often were built underground in order in some ways, quite deliberately, I think, to highlight the, um, what they call the descent of the Yerida into galut into exile that so that anywhere else you are in the world when you come to Israel you're ascending you know in some way and uh, that was done pretty self-consciously dark gloomy um, um, windowless you know spaces you know without light um, so there's that that kind of cultural residence or national residence say say in Israel but in the cases of the um, you know the kind of the, the crypt in on the Ile de Cité I think she was struck that in, this was not a place that was celebratory or triumphant in, in some ways, but in order to open up that kind of that dark space within us, something that in fact would not be, uh, cannot be filled in, um, you open up that space in, in the earth. And I think that place struck her, and I think also the place in the landscape, the great wound in the landscape in the sum um, by Lutens, I, I think also just it resonated in a way that the ground can be wounded by what happens here, that that too, you know, is a statement. And to descend into something, to have the, the horizons kind of disappear for that moment leaves, leaves you alone in a way with yourself and your fellow rememberers uh, in ways um, that I think um, allows you to internalize a process. It, it makes this memory it, you know, internal as opposed to going up to the top of the Washington Monument and looking out all around you. 
it becomes a more private, personal space uh, this way. And I think, I think all of those things she, she actually saw, thought through, and that was what she wanted to do with the Vietnam Veterans Monument. Thanks. Thank you.